will start with really cool masterclass. Ladies and gentlemen, fundraising masterclass from the thinking to acting. And on the this very stage, I would like to invite two superstars of it. Yone Vaitkevichude, the partner at Startup Wise Guys. Good morning, Yone. Morning. How are you? Great, it's Here hot. Pat, Marius Andriauskas, portfolio <laughs> principal at Startup Wise Guys. All right, morning. All right, give a big round of applause, everybody. Oh, all right, all right. It seems that it's already very crowded over here, so you're also welcome to join us. It's sunny, it, the weather is amazing, it's Friday. So we have to enjoy and listen to the great masterclass. The sta stage is yours, guys. Good luck. Thanks. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, it's really hot. And uh, thanks for coming. I see some venture capitalists listening how to do the fundraising. So it's a good, uh, good evaluation for me and Marius already. So we'll take a little bit of your time. I hope for those who are watching online, you will really kind of uh, get the chance to do the screenshots of the slides. There will be quite a lot of content. So it's not something that you had yesterday where it was more like uh, chat and fire, uh, fireside chats. And uh, today you'll, you're really here to learn. So we'll try to do, cover quite a lot of content. So bear with us. Um, and we'll do that together with Marius in a duo. So that's an interesting setup. So without further ado, just uh, very quickly, who am I here? So I'm uh, Yanya, partner at Start of Wise Guys, uh, working together with uh, uh, our partners here to invest in early stage companies and accelerate them. Uh, so probably you have seen us around in the red attire. And uh, yeah, uh, one of our main topics and accelerators actually how to help those early stage companies to fundraise. It's, uh, it's a massive, massive topic that also makes us as a fund and accelerator successful. So that's why today myself and uh, my colleague Marius are here to cover it. Yes, guys, uh, good morning. My name is Marius. I'm portfolio principal at Startup Ice Guys Holding uh, with the 250 startups already on board and planning 30 new startups this year as well. Previously, I'm an entrepreneur myself, had an early startup in Lithuania called Teamgate and now also launching the Venture app. You can double check if you are raising. So happy to share all the knowledge, experience and tips and tricks. Cool. So a little bit uh, kind of an intro on why we think this topic is so important. And um, if you have been following the news, what has been happening lately, I think especially yesterday gave a good uh, understanding that, well, unicorns are coming. Uh, there is loads of investment in the market, but how it actually looks like. So just a short intro. Uh, some data from Crunchbase showing that actually the dollar volume or the volume of investments has actually remained steady and a little bit growing in 2020. What it means that when everyone were predicting that 2020 will be a disaster year for startups, everyone will stop investing. No one did. So uh, actually everyone kept on investing and putting the dollars into the companies, same globally and the same in Europe. But if we look a little bit closer, actually here quarter by quarter from 2019, the deal uh, count, actually, the number of deals made uh, went uh, much lower or dramatically lower globally on European scale. It was a little bit varying on the Baltics for uh, some reasons like accelerator investments and similar. But what it means, actually, is that uh, much more uh, money uh, were invested in one company, so the ticket sizes were actually growing compared to the previous years. And I'll come back to a little bit like a summary of that and what it means for you as startups, uh, these trends, which we see actually continuing. So if we look also to some interesting stats, um, in Europe, several prominent countries like, let's say, uh, Sweden, France, Germany, they have also remained their investments quite uh, on a stable level. And surprisingly, if everyone expected the uh, UK to be kind of uh, exited with a Brex uh, Brexit like in Eurovision Song Contest, so actually nothing bad happened to them. They, they still remain one of the most uh, attractive uh, uh, countries for, for the venture capital investments. What happened in Baltics, and if you see the last, last dot here, uh, as of today, we see that the volumes will be massively higher this year in the Baltics in terms of investment compared to any other previous year. However, as mentioned, the number of deals, it's either the same or even getting a bit lower. So what it means, there is actually a lot of money in the market, much more money in the market than there has been before globally and on the Baltic level as well. 
but the funds are making bigger bets in either their portfolio companies doing bridge rounds or actually just you know taking something that they really like and putting much more money not small tickets but much larger tickets so it means that there is m less spray and pray and putting you know tiny tickets in many companies but more big bets what it means for you as a startups that there is much higher competition to really get the attention of the venture capitalists and get that investment. So this is why today me and Marius here are to tell you how to like really stand out and prepare for that so you actually can be one of those in this volume invested. So over to you, Marius. Thanks, Jana. So what we see and what does it mean competition, right? Competition di dictates quality. And in quality, it means every detail it matters, right? So when we see the typical no, uh, question, are you fundraising? Uh, we're doing always this exercise and asking the audience, what would be your short answer? Yeah, the typically yes, no, maybe, soon, something like this. But when we see those conversations, when it really happens in life with investors, you know, and the investor is asking, are you fundraising? You know, typically investor asking yes, we start of saying yes, we're raising. Investor saying, why? We need a capital. How much? Let's say 500,000. For what? And then it started. Sales and marketing, the classic answer. But what for? Specific. Salaries, entering the markets, building the product, right? What for? Specific. And then there is, you know, this kind of mood. There is no answer from the startup. So what does it fundraising stands for? If we take the similar like uh, uh, sentence from the Investopedia, right? We see that the fundraising stands for the startup raised money in the rounds of investment with investors, venture funds, to focus on a specific growth points. And when we try to extract this simple sentence, we see how matters it really. So the raise is the funding options, the process, the timeline. Under the money, we see the how much, the valuation, the formula, and formula behind this, reverse engineering, how you become to this, right? When we see after the rounds and investments, what rounds, the structure, right? The investors, what type of investors, what is the best fit investor in the particular round? Then finding the lead investor, finding the co-investor, then dealing with this, and of course, the specific growth points is super important because everything starts from this point. And it starts from the founder's goals, that we're always forgetting about this. It starts from the founder's goals, why you started all this. And then it goes to a company goals, then it goes to investor goals, understanding growth point and the round structure. And when we try to put it everything on a flat, like in a stable, and frame it, we see that from thinking to really raising the capital, it really diff there is a big difference in this. On the thinking stage, we see that there is starting from the understanding your goals as a founder, then trying to put it as a company goals, right? And, and moving forward, preparation, we see that there is the growth points, needs, uh, round goals, etc., etc. And when we try to see it as a horizontal line, right? We see how it's connected. You setting the company goals, you setting the growth points, you understanding how much capital you need in the particular growth point, and then preparing for this. Then you understanding your funding options. What do you need from funding options in the particular phase? Are you going after the crowdfunding? Are you going business angels? Are you going after the uh, uh, private equity capital, right? Are you going after the corporate money? Because there is a big difference in the time frame, in the selection, in the process, and this is really matters. Then, of course, understanding your investors' goals. In the different stages, different investors, and different investors have different goals. And of course, preparing like data room. Uh, data room is always that startups are forgetting and have no time for. We know it from practice, but it's super time consuming when it comes to a due diligence process, when it comes to real preparation. And this data room is really, really matters. And of course, building the pipeline, finding the lead investor, the co-investor, etc. So let's go into the details. What does it mean setting the company goals? If we see this let's say classical uh, OKR example, objective and key result by, uh, by Google, right? Uh, VCs typically like this kind of structure. You're putting your company goals in a one pager, A4 one pager. And uh, it looks like, like this. You know, you're starting from this big picture, like five years ultimate goal, that you want to become the best of the best in what you're building. And it should be measured. How you're going to achieve? What does it mean the best of the best, right? And there is, you're going to be number one customer choice of your category. You're going to be 
top five category leader. You're going to be number one employee voted by, right? You're going to achieve one million in valuation in this particular phase. And then when it's clear your longer goals, it doesn't mean to be specific in details, then you're going in 18 months or 12 months, very detailed specific OKRs, for example. And then it goes like this, 18 months company goals, like small step, you're becoming number 10 customer choice of your category. You're starting sales, for example, in the ER region or in the particular country like Germany, for example, entering the UK, right? <clears throat> then you're planning to increase your uh, sales by 30% uh, on a deal volume, let's say, and you're going to increase sales on the particular country as a go-to-market strategy, right? And only then, when you have the company goals for a 12 or 18 months, you're getting down to a CEO goals, you're getting, getting down to a product, marketing, and all the key employees that you're having there. So you're having the long vision, you're having the 18 miles detailed goals, you're having the specific goals for key employees and the co-founders, right? And then it comes to a setting growth points. What does it mean setting growth point? So this is the classic five years picture. When I say classic, I'm going to show some benchmarks later. Uh, in a five years range. Typically it starts from the accelerator, incubator, your idea, go, you're going to a pre-seed in the six months, then you're going to a seed round in a year two, then series A, and in upcoming uh, two years, series B. So basically the benchmark in five years to, to go after series B. And when you're setting up your you know, ultimate goal for a five years, and you're trying to narrow this, so you're getting a real numbers what you need to achieve here. And for example, from the acceleration point, if we see, or incubation point, or angel round, let's call it early stage, right? You need to say that, okay, I need to validate my idea. What does it mean? I need to hit at least 10K MRR, monthly recurring revenue. That is the best proof that your idea is valid. Or go after other traction, not necessarily MRR, right? It means to reach like freemium users, to reach some, some downloads, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, uh, then, then you can say that customer choice, the category leader, small steps, but it should be measurable. And then you're saying, okay, I'm going to achieve this in six months, and I have another growth point. You need always to plan two growth points up front, so you know the next round and probably the next round. So you can do reverse engineering and calculate how much money you really need. We'll do this exercise. So in the, in the 18 months, you have this range for the pre-seed round. And when it comes to the question, so how much capital do I need? So I know the goals in the six months. I know the goals in the upcoming pre-seed round or 18 months goals. So how much capital do I need? How to do this calculation in precise to understanding the real number, not just, you know, taking from the year, I need beautiful number, 300,000. I need beautiful number, half a million. Always, I'm raising a million, right? Beautiful number. So. This is the, 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 the area about understanding your growth point. And very quickly, very quickly to remind you know, that we're always saying that there are basically three scenarios that you need to pick before you know moving forward with your startup. What you really want to achieve. So in the classic way, you know, when you are pre-startup, startup, and you are scale-up, there are basically three scenarios that you need to uh, understand what is the best way? So the first one, of course, but we were talking yesterday all the day about the unicorns, you know, going after the IPO and uh, becoming the 0 0.01 chance to achieve this, but it's a great goal. Everyone's, because it's attractive, it's fun, you know, to become a unicorn. I'm personally the fan of this middle uh, green line that you're going after, let's say, 300, 400, 500 million valuation of the company. You're going after the M&A. We are not talking much about M&A, but it's happening a lot in the Europe, in the US, and especially it's increasing for the last year. So the M&A is a good scenario. You are acquired by a bigger giant. You know, you're really getting as a founder with a good cash or staying in the company. And, and, and this is a really good scenario for you. And this is, of course, the third scenario that is a failure. Uh, we also not talking too much about this, but we like to talk this. The failure is okay scenario. You're standing up, you're not burning out, you know, doing another, another venture, you're moving on. And uh, quickly before this, I really want to say that, guys, the 100 million valuation is no more ambitious in the Baltics from what we see. You know, five years ago when it's okay, I want to become 100 million valuation, it's a really good uh, goal. But now it's no more ambition. 500 million valuation in the Europe is no more ambitious anymore. 
Even a unicorn is no more ambitious in the US. You need to dream about becoming a decacorn. So this is changing a lot, and we're gonna talk about this because there is a super a lot of capital uh, in the market. So uh, let's get back to how much capital we need. This is the uh, index ventures published like six months ago in December 2020. The benchmark of the B2B SaaS uh, over nine years scale, uh, the traction table. So you can see here uh, on a, on a, on a uh, red table that there is the years. Zero year, the angel, early stage, then you know, pre-seed, seed, series A, and you go listing. Nine year benchmark to become a unicorn or going after the IPO. And you can see the RRR, annual recurring revenue, in millions. So year one or year or zero, let's say year, we're saying the traction is zero. It means that we're talking about tens of thousands of MRR. And typically, as a startup, what we see that this is super challenging, this is super difficult. And we're so proud about hitting 1K MRR, but it doesn't matter. 1K MRR, 5K MRR is the same zero. 10K MRR is the same zero. You're in the same bracket. In the Baltics, of course, we're competing about those early stage investors, et cetera, et cetera, but it doesn't matter. You need to hit. If you really want to go after the unicorn, if you really want to go after 500 million valuation, you need to have to this pace. You need to go in one year to 50K MRR, in other words, 600K in RRR. In year two, in year three, before the Series A, we're talking about 2 million on RRR. With that 300% pace of growth, this is the pace if, if you want to really go after the unicorn status or to really be successful in the APO. And when it comes to this, our growth points, right? We need to understand, so how much capital do we need? And this is kind of the math. I'm saying that in 18 months, I'm going, it's a very simple example. So I'm saying that I'm going from 10K MRR to 50K MRR with a 300% annual growth, the benchmark. We're going with a 500, let's say 500 euros deal uh, to uh, the same 650 with a 30% growth. We're trying to keep, as it B2B, let's say, we're trying to keep $2,000 uh, uh, customer acquisition cost. It would be the same. And we're taking three people to 12 people as a core team, okay? As a benchmark, right? And we're doing quick calculation. So we're saying, okay, we need to grow 14K MRR in 18 months with average deal 500 euros, 80 new customers with acquisition cost 2,000. 160,000 from the bringing new customers. And then we're saying 12 people on board. Increasing, let's do the calculation with average salary 3.5K, not hiring in the one day, let's divide it in 18 months, additional trade. So we're saying we need uh, 550,000. And the investors really like not to speculate, but to challenge you when they're talking. So how much really capital you need? So when you bring in 100 customers, what happens if the customer acquisition cost increase? What happens if you need 15 people? What happens this? What's your first hire? Blah, 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 right? But this is matters. And the investors always calculate it. And when you're saying, I need 2,000, uh, 200,000, I need 100,000. But in the reality, the math shows that you need 500,000. And the investor knows that probably not in 18 months, but in nine months, you need a bridge round. And they calculate this, that you didn't do your homework right. But this is, you know, the generic calculation for a talking with the investor when it comes, you know, to really, really understand this, uh, this math behind it. And there is precise calculation that you're doing the homework for uh, two weeks with all your co-founders. And on the precise calculation, we have competitor analysis, market channeling, uh, marketing channels analysis with the separate customer acquisition costs. Then we have the sales plan with the impact, commission plan, detailed unit economics, PNL forecast. Uh, hiring plan and of course the emergence plan that typically no one is calculating in. And uh, very quickly overviewing this, so on the co competitor's analysis, simply math, it's not enough to have this one slide that typically you no know, doing this and adding your competitor's names. You're doing the real, real uh, analysis at least of a top competitors every three months. And it's time consuming, but when you're doing this, you're getting so much answer about this. You're starting from the competitor's brand, value proposition, of what keywords they are at, uh, in what positions uh, of stores, how many downloads they have, how many web visitors they have, how many languages they have in a, uh, in a, uh, in a website, how many languages they have on the product, because it impacts and gives you understanding in what markets they are, or they going, and what positions you're competing with, and you can do reverse calculation on how you're really competing in what positions. 
You cannot be naive, you're just simply competing with a brand. You need really to understand uh, what are you, in what categories, in what countries you are competing with. And this is the one exercise. And then it comes to understanding what capital and what growth point. It really helps you, for you, first of all, for business, to understand how your competitor was moving over those growth points and stages in the same time to understand what capital in each particular stage they want. And when you're talking to an investor, you're saying, you're saying with the confidence, our competitor just traced 50 million in the particular stage because they needed this, and we are going now after 5 million. You're kidding, right? We, we cannot compete this. This is a very simple example, N26, right? Angel Round made 2013 25K. Then going in one year, 2 million seed round. In one year, Series A, 10 million. In one year, Series B, 40 million. As you see, four years. Series C, 160, then in two years, 300 million. Uh, the classic story, classic benchmark. And when you're doing, this is very easy to do this. You're just opening the benchmark, spy a few similar web, and th that's it. Two hours, you can do the same table for each competitor. And it gives you credibility, and it gives you, as well, diligence as a founder, as a startup you know, uh, CEO, uh, that you do understand what's happening. So, so yes, uh, as I said, uh, not advertisement, just, just saying, many tools, right, like similar web, have a few, you, you can really do this. All. As well, marketing channels, uh, typical. In the Baltics, we're always talking about Captera, GetApp, G2 Crowd, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And it's good. It's a good channel, especially in B2B. It's really working. The same, there are many different channels for B2C, but when it comes to those answers, you know, inbound versus outbound, outsource versus in the company, hires, et cetera, et cetera, you need to do the calculations on the customer acquisition cost. Different, because there is no one line on the customer acquisition cost. It's different lines, and you need to add it in your budget about the different cal calculation cost. Then, of course, the sales plan with the impact. The year starting, January was saying, yay, we have 12 months of the sales, right? Uh, 12 months of the sales period. But in the reality, it's not like this. And when you're planning, the typical mistake, your sales plan, you know, exponential growth. And the reality it comes this crocodile, like we call, because you didn't plan in the real, real uh, in, in the reality. So in the reality, those external force majeures, like three months of the summer, it's typically down for B2B. Two weeks of different day offs, cultural impacts like Christmas, Ramadan, Thanksgiving. It's always about this, right? Then internal forces like two weeks per person is sick per year. You need to put also to, to plan this. 1.5 weeks per year is uh, off for personal reason. Two months per year person is not productive at all. Not their focus and typically when you're hiring the sales rep or the sales account, account executive, it's taking three to six months to be in a full progr progressive in, uh, and effective uh, in, in your company. Uh, as well, commission plans, uh, they are not included in the PNL. Uh, they do not have the sailings. So what we see, so when you're planning the commissions, you are not really planning in a um, proper way, and that's why it's hitting you in the budget. Uh, they are based on a, on a sales team, not like a customer acquisition, not on a lead generator person, and you cannot put your uh, only on the for sales rep because the motivation comes pretty soon and you need to rebuild. Those companies who are commission driven uh, in the old organization, sometimes including uh, even developers, they are really performing well. So you need to find the best examples that's really working for your company. And of course, the referrals and affiliates. We're hearing a lot about these partnerships, referrals and affiliates, but when it comes to reality, how did you calculating this? How, what's the commission? What's the percentage? It's not, really, it's not really proper what we see. And of course, unit economics. In your particular vertical, in your particular business, is it one to three, is it one to five, or is it one to 10? What is the best unit economics? You need to know what is the best unit economics because like five years ago, one to three was really good unit economics. Now, sometimes it's even one to five, one to 10, not good unit economics. And of course, everything goes to a master budget plan, hiring, firing plan, you know, you always need to calculate about not only hiring, if, you, if, if, if it requires, you know, uh, after the agency, plus one salary, if you're firing one, plus one salary, plus taxes, et cetera, et cetera, it's hitting to your planning to a budget. This is the price calculation. Of course, uh, inflation as well. At least 2% you need to add this. And everything after precising, uh, you adding like 5% on emergency and planet, the budget, because it's typically what happens. You know, we, whatever we are precise and diligence, it's uh, those 5% is still here. 
And yes, and then you have the answer, right? So you say, my goal is to reach 50K MRR in 18 months, to reach top 10 customer choice of my category product, to increase the average deal size by 30%, right? To keep the same customer, cus uh, cus customer acquisition cost in the same level, and to bring 12 talent as a core team in my team. And for that, my EBIT is minus 300%, uh, 300 euros, counting 40 months with a runway. Uh, uh, I have the runway of uh, five months. That means by that time I need to close the round. And that's why, you know, I, I am looking to close the round by that time. You're giving the specific timeline for the investors, how much time you have, you want to close the round. And when it comes to this exercise, are you fundraising? And typically, yes, no, soon. This is the structure how the answer should be answered. Yes, we're raising 350K pre-seed round with the venture funds to become top 10 customer choice of our product, to reach 50K MRR, and to prepare for the seed round in 18 months. No, okay, but in six months, we will be opening a 350 round, the same structure to become 10 customer choice, to hit uh, 50K MRR. The no is also a really good answer, but you're giving, they're giving insight and clarity to investors to keep you in the loop, to put it in your pipeline, to reach, and to give the updates. Because when you think you are not fundraising now, and on, it's only six months, actually you're fundraising. You're basically working on your traction and the preparation and the keeping in the loop is really important. Yes, so what about rounds and valuations, <laughs> Yona? Thank you. I think uh, we all need to take uh, like a deep breath after all this information. <laughs> I hope that at least like you took some pictures or, or, or uh, did, did your calculation in your head, but I think yeah, the maybe a few things to recap. So what was Mario is telling, I think before any fundraising, you need to know why you are fundraising, right? So what's your, what are your goals? You like really identify those, understand on how much money you will need for that. And ideally you're super good at uh, math or like calculating, making math in your head because uh, these questions, they appear like out of nowhere. You can come with the best uh, uh, Excel prepare, but at the end of the day, it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation. It's a light, you know, like a human conversation where you might get a, a question, you kind of need to think, okay, what do I need to take into account? So I think this is just kind of the first part and it's super getting hot in here, <laughs> but we're getting closer to closing around. So uh, I'll take over now a little bit to tell you, so you know, you understand what you want to do, uh, what do you want to achieve, you know how much money do you need. And of course, there's always this magic question about the valuation and the terms. So don't expect that I will tell you exact valuations, what you should be raising at. And there is probably not, no such answer. But if you are really just entering, let's say, the market, uh, your early stage SaaS startup, I would say the benchmark is usually would be, you know, your monthly recurring revenues multiplied by either 100 or to 200. That it depends on your growth rate, right? So that's like, if you really just like, you think like, okay, so how much am I worth? You can multiply that. But um, without like looking much into like very specific numbers, of course, like if you want to get the 200x or like higher multiples, then your month on month growth has to be like really quite significant, like 20, 25%. But I think the more uh, often question is, what do I do if I have no revenue, right? So I'm not even talking about the, something that's there on the left corner, EBITDA. That's not something that I think we usually take into account. And that's a little bit for later stage companies, how you do the valuation. But if you have no revenues, what do you do then? And there are for sure certain benchmarks in the market that how, like how valuation should look like. They differ from region to region. We all know that in US you're getting higher valuation in Europe maybe a little bit uh, smaller. But that actually a lot goes down into what Marius was telling in the first part. So if you really know what you want to achieve and you really know where you will spend the money and you come to investor and say, I need 200,000 euros, then your valuation a lot will be also calculated how to make this investment because I believe the team can achieve that without uh, completely ruining the cap table, right? So not taking too much of equity, 10, 20%, that also depends a lot on the round. But uh, this, is, uh, you know, this is where I think the first kind of part of the, uh, of the master class comes into place that if you really know where you will spend it, then a lot will go down into this, uh, let's say, basic calculation of how to make sure that you get the money and then you also have sufficient uh, equity in your cap table for later rounds, right? And again, this is the table that Marius has showed, right? So uh, exactly how, let's say, how you should be growing to go from angel to series A, B, C, D, and D and later. 
And uh, this is, of course, when you have certain revenue level, then you could open kind of the global benchmarks and say like, okay, like this is somewhat that we should be looking at. And of course, you should have seen probably also change ventures reports about you know the average valuations in the Baltics, which might might be a bit closer than you know something that index ventures has shown here. And also uh, speaking of uh, the unit economics and uh, what Marius mentioned, especially important in your valuation uh, are the metrics. So not only the revenues, but plenty of other metrics depending on what kind of business you are. So we speak a lot about SaaS which is maybe pretty straightforward, and historically we had had plenty of those, but we also have B2C marketplaces, B2B2C, and there are certain thresholds. How do you have to be performing if you, for example, want to raise Series A? So that's maybe a little bit long in the journey, but uh, you can look at it and say like, okay, like, am I, you know, how close am I to 1, point, uh, 1 to 2 3 mil million ARR, right? This is when I will be getting Series A. And you can find actually plenty of <laughs> those good tips uh, also on Point Nine Capital. They're doing those uh, fundraising canvases. For sure, check them out. I didn't put it here. Um, but uh, yeah, that's something that you can actually look at and definitely make sure you use those resources and don't come into, let's say, investors having no clue of you know what kind of metrics are the metrics needed for Series, C, uh, series A, Seed, or whatever. At the end of the day, when you will be fundraising, uh, I like to say that you know, if you have you know certain equity in a very good company, it's much better than having you know 50% in a bad company. So at the end of the day, this is you know a 0.9 capital survey uh, that was done with investors. How much each of these things matter, and as you can see, valuation at the end does not matter that much. The team matters a lot. So. You know, in this whole fundraising process, uh, don't get too fixated on, you know, oh, what's the, the valuation that I'm getting? You know, I'm, I don't want to give away more than this and that. Know uh, the thresholds, know what's happening in the market, how the market is changing, but just don't go just after that <laughs> because you can see there's so many more other mo more important points. So if you have now a rough understanding also of, you know, the, uh, yeah, the goals that you want to do, the money that you need to fundraise, you kind of have uh, all the calculations done in your head, you more or less understand that, okay, I have these certain metrics, and with this round, I will achieve the necessary metrics, let's say for series A or seed round. Um, what do you do then? And then you actually start approaching the investors. Then you actually start talking. So this is will be super brief and might be a little bit technical, but just for you to kind of, you know, take a picture off and go and prepare. I can really tell from our experience, if founders come prepared with the materials that uh, I will list in the next slide, we're like immediately like taken aback. We're like, you know, this is a super diligent founders. It might mean that they will be also working like that uh, for, you know, uh, for, for the duration of the company journey. And it immediately makes you stand out. As and I mentioned in the very beginning, it's important to stand out because there are so many similar cases coming in with very similar ambitions, uh, very similar, let's say, value propositions, and even with different products, but all those companies might blend in. And a pretty easy way to stand out is really just to be very diligent at the beginning of the process. So this is a list of materials that I would say it's a must to have. And uh, before you go to fundraise, like really later pre-seed or s seed round, so start from you know a short blurb and like a forwardable email. So you will need a lot of intros to go on fundraise, right? So you will need to ask people around not to only send cold emails, but say like, oh, maybe you know this and that person, and someone will say, yeah, sure, I can do an intro. But how it happens usually with an intro is no one does an intro because you just don't have enough time to think, okay, so this company is doing that, they are doing this, I will attach their pitch deck. Actually, very few people will go after, you know, this kind of uh, go the, uh, after the smile to do an intro for you. So uh, you really need to kind of give something to other people. Also, once you're sending as a called outreach, but also if, let's say, after <laughs> this uh, workshop, we go out from the stage and you say, maybe you can do an introduction to this and this investor. We say, yes, uh, actually, we need to look, you know, what you're doing, but if you can forward me something like this, you follow it up within a few hours, that's perfect. So you have to have it ready. A short teaser or a deck, a uh, and the pitch deck, it's two different things. So remember that pitch deck that you are pitching on the stage is definitely not something you are sending because it's a lot of pictures, it's interactive, definitely not something like what we are presenting here. This is uh, something that 
you could, let, let's say, a lot of information, it's a standalone, I could send it to you, you wouldn't even need me on the stage, you could look at it. So this is also the investor deck that you need to have. Something that you send attached to an email, and no one, let's say, has like particular questions, okay, what does it mean? What's this picture of like, I don't know, a big bang means in your pitch deck? So you don't need those. Then of course, be prepared with a forecast that Marius has mentioned, so some calculations, very important. Have this so-called data room, <laughs> and this is what we really work with startups on. In the data room, look at it as your storage room on Google Drive, whatever, Dropbox, just a list of uh, all the documents that you might need. Investors say, oh, you know, you go through like kind of, you get through to, to the investor, they say, okay, I like what you're doing, can you share me, you know, uh, your sales materials that you're approaching your clients? Okay, here is the link, please look at it. They usually how it happens in the early stage is that, oh, can you send me this? Oh, uh -huh, okay, then you spend three days looking for that, asking all the team around how, how we can add it. You attach it to the email, investor loses it somewhere, you follow up after f five days, the momentum is gone, right? So really take a look at this data room. It's like a universal concept. Just Google that, copy paste, and you know, like really use it. And of course, um, quite a few other things that you could have, but uh, something like a newsletter, uh, a loom of your product, basically a demo of your product, super nice to have things. So if you have a pitch deck and you think you're ready to fundraise, really at least have those first seven that you want to go after. And one that uh, yeah, I didn't mention, very important, if you want to fundraise, don't start from, um, I know here is Practica somewhere, I know there is Iron Wolf somewhere, start with wise guys on the stage. You have to have a curated list of investors that you want to target, and why do you want to target them? Right, so just don't go after like the big names that are not in your stage, because that will be uh, really. Uh, congrats, Marius, for getting the hat. I'm next. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, really make sure that you don't waste your time and you don't waste investors' time of just going after someone that's not investing in your round. So really, really just kind of be humble, understand where you are in, in, this, uh, in, the, in the space. And sometimes we also, like, we see, we really want to invest in some startups, but they are uh, let's not in our stage. And we see, like, if we do that, we actually might ruin the whole round if we come in, for example, in the company that's a bit too late for us. And very important to know, and we did not uh, highlight this too much, but you might have heard that actually closing a round is not that quick as you might think. So if you are running out of money now, you should have started yesterday, that's obvious. So this is a very rough timeline. If you start fundraising pre-seed seed round, I would say that three months, four months, definitely you can close it. Very much depends on really how much you are prepared. So you can really shorten it very quickly, but then you have to do the preparation before. So why? I put this month one, month two, month three, is because actually we do these preparations in Accelerator very steadily, slowly. We identify that we will need to fundraise in six, seven months' time. So we start preparing, updating, curating the investors' lists. And then we start actually when we say, okay, now it's the fundraising time. So now it's actually the go time. It's not like I raise a little bit, I don't raise, I do sales, I do that. No, like one of your teammates actually has to say, like, is usually it's the founder. I'm going in almost full time. I'm gonna be spending, you know, four weeks basically doing no sales because I will be approaching investors like in parallel, a mass of them. I will be scheduling the calls. I will be following them up. I will be running to those meetings. You really plan it very carefully in your schedule. Uh, the worst thing I would say is when the company is constantly fundraising. When you're like fundraising, after a year you come to startup fair, you're again fundraising and you're fundraising and everyone remembers you because they know like, okay, so you probably didn't close the round last time, so what happened? So if you actually happen to be in that situation, be also very humble about that. So okay, like uh, last year we have figured this out, we have pivoted to this, we have tested out different business models, now we actually know what we are doing and now we are actually fundraising. So really be serious about this step. This is a, a separate, let's say, process in the company that you cannot be doing a little bit or not doing a little bit. And yes, and of course, um, in the whole process, uh, once you're talking with investors, I would say that you really need to coordinate the meeting. So don't do also outreach to one investor, get a no, outreach to another investor, make sure you reach out to many of them at once. It will save your time for sure. You will get very valuable feedback. So going to the next meeting tomorrow, you already have some feedback, you can actually use it. 
And then, uh, yeah, if you just extend that process, I can tell you, you reach out to investor, one, two weeks, they come back, they invite you a meeting, you schedule a meeting here, one month passed since you actually <laughs> emailed them, right? And this is not because, like, uh, uh, investors are too busy. This is, of course, because you are also busy, and investors are busy on the other side, and just, m you know, matching the time that fits everyone is uh, going to be pretty tough. And with the talks, keep on tracking. Definitely make sure you have this list. Okay, I spoke with this person. This is the follow-up. This is what I need to send, and make sure you follow that. Those startups that we have in our portfolio and they're doing that, it's really just lovely to watch. We open uh, that spreadsheet, and we understand at what stage they are with which investor. And then we also can go to that investor and say, okay, so I see that the process has stopped a little bit. You know, what happens? So make sure that you also, if you have investors already on board or someone who is helping you, that you also make them aware aware of what's happening and don't say, uh, yeah, I spoke with this and that, I don't really remember what I need to do, and especially don't forget to follow up on what you agreed. And most important, once you will actually get like some, you know, mm, that's interesting, make sure you uh, make a difference from, uh, wow, this is interesting, let's keep on talking. Uh, this is interesting, but you are a little bit too early. This is a no. It's just immediately a no, right? So you just put, the, put that investor in the kind of the, your uh, brackets where you go to for the seed round or later, and you really want to get that term sheet. Term sheet is a real commitment. Any soft commitments is a soft commitment. You saw, I think, many startups on the stage yesterday pitching. The soft commitment, uh, when startup mentions we have commitments, and then investors immediately in the panel asked, so what, uh, what are those commitments from? Are they term sheets? No, they're soft commitments. Ah, okay, so soft commitment, it means I'm saying, I'm interested, I could invest, you know, 100,000 euros, but actually I have another 300 startups on the line that might be looking for the same thing. A strong commitment is uh, usually uh, indicated by a term sheet, and surprise, surprise, term sheet helps you to attract other investors much easier. So this is what you want to go to, and actually, um, and, uh, yeah, and actually the reach, uh, reach the stage of term sheet, and from that I would say calculate a month or two, to actually get the money in the bank account. So really be careful with that, and we say you haven't closed the round until the money is in the bank account. I think you see all the press releases about the big rounds. They definitely happen way after any term sheet is signed, way after uh, shareholders' agreements are signed. It's really when the com both sides are sure that the transaction has happened. So a very difficult process in short. So now uh, you have uh, you found the lead investor, the co-investors, you have the term sheet ready, the money in the bank account, and Marius will tell a little bit how to find that specific investor. Yes, uh, thanks a lot, Jonia. So just quickly repeating, right? We started from the founder's goals. That is super important, and this exercise is typically, typically is not done properly. But let's presume you started from founder's goal. It get down to a company goals, ultimate goals, five years. Then you have a precise planning on 18 months goals. Then you know those growth points and how much capital you need, right? You know the company valuation, at least for negotiation with the venture funds, right? You have your own material. You have your data room is ready. And now who is the best fit investor? And when you think about the investor, especially about the venture capital, we typically align this. Investor is equal to venture capital, but not necessary, right? It's a crowdfunding, a corporate investor, business angels. But if you see from the ventures, uh, uh, venture capital funds perspective, it's like startup. For me, it was the biggest finding. It's like startup. It's not co-founders, it's partners. They're going after no capital, they're raising, always raising the new fund, the new fund. They're going after the private, they're going after the institutional money. They have the value proposition, they have the websites, etc., etc. So. If you open the crunch base and you see the typical filter the, of the investors, you see how many options there are. Like, as I mentioned, venture capital, individual investors, right? Private equity firms, accelerators, incubators, micro VCs, angel groups, uh, syndicates, etc., etc., etc. So let's take one this example, that, that most useful example, venture capital firms. So I know, uh, I know Andres is uh, <laughs> here around. So I'll, I'll take Change Ventures as example in the Baltics, right? You're opening the website. Typically, typically, from our search, there is like majority of the VCs do not have the proper website. And you cannot find as a start the proper information. But if they do, you look to this uh, 
key, I would say, information to align what are you looking for. You're starting from the, of course, the type. If it's VC, where it's based, where it's presence, can you meet them physically, right? Are they leading or are they only co-investing? The big decision. If you're looking for a lead investor, you need to understand that this particular VC can lead the round. And the lead is not just the name. You need to understand what does it mean lead. It's, I would say, soft commitment for the future. The lead investor, can you give it the hand when it comes to a bridge round, et cetera, et cetera, and many things. Of course, to understanding the pre-seed, seed, seed late seed, in which stage, with a particular ticket sizes and follow-ons, they can invest. What does it mean? It means that they typically can invest from a 400,000 to something like uh, up to a million, but they can do the follow-ons to a 1.5 million. So in the next round, they can be the help and they can participate, or sometimes even they can co-lead. And it is really, really important when you're planning your two growth points, you know that now you need 300,000, it could be a good fit, and next time you need two million, they can also participate. As well, what is the size of the fund? You would be surprised, I would say you would be surprised that you know how many funds are looking for the startups and doing scouting without the money. They do not invest because the fund is over, but they still do scouting because they need the pipeline for the investors. And it's a proper question or your research to understand how much money do they have in the fund and can they really invest. As well, to see what is the notable investments. It's your homework to see what is the notable investments to find the co-founders on the LinkedIn and to talk about this VC, how it's happening, how is the collaboration, what is that really, you know, uh, approach about this collaboration. Is it really helping you for the business with the next rounds, etc., etc.? And then when it comes to this real matchmaking, you need to understand, are they targeting the B2B, only B2C, digital, semi-digital, right? And what verticals are preferred? The same, let's take Lemonade Sand, another VC from the Baltics, right? And if we see the same, uh, the same structure, the same side, fund is lower, investment follow-ons is lower, the ticket size is lower, but it's private. And uh, it's focused only on B2B and only digital, right? It's a big signal for you, if you are not a digital, if you are semi-digital, that you're probably not targeting, not just wasting your time and this time. So you having to scrap the information and you trying to put yourself as well. This is the one of the examples from our previous batch. The FinTech company, they extract themselves and they say, okay, we are in the pre seed, -seed round, we're going after 700K, uh, not described valuation, 200,000 commitment, and we are looking for 400, 500,000 tickets. So what is the best fit uh, for us? We are not ready to flip the company. It means they want to stick in Lithuania, because if you go after some capital, for example, in the Poland, in Germany, in the UK, uh, in the Baltics, we have around 30 venture capital firms. Uh, and of course, it's naturally that there are a lot of capital, for example, in Poland, in Germany, in the UK, who are looking to the Baltic talents. But if you are not ready to flip your company, meaning moving into your physical company in the Poland or moving your company in the UK, et cetera, et cetera, probably it's not good for you. If you're not ready, you're not targeting them, right? And then, of course, the business type, the industries, and then you're doing the matchmaking. So this is your company. This is your one venture fund, this is another venture fund, and you're doing the matchmaking. And when you realize what is the best fit, then you put it in the pipeline. And then the <laughs> fun starts, right? Uh, the fun and uh, the summary of what we uh, just said. So uh, the last uh, time, I think, of course, like we do a much more extensive uh, workshop like that in our accelerator, going through each step uh, in different workshops. Uh, but still, we'll try to summarize a little bit what you should be paying attention to and what the fundraising is, and we hope like some things will stick. I think the most important, at least for me, from from this workshop, is to understand that your fundraising happens to achieve some goals. It doesn't happen because you're running out of money. You need to achieve some goals, right? No one will give you money if ju ju that's just for the sake of money. So. Definitely remember, you need to prepare and know your goals. They might get adjusted. Don't be afraid, you know, like 
to, to say those out loud and uh, for sure investors will understand that things change. But now you come with a very clear investment thesis that you need to bring to investor. And that's a very popular, like kind of a popular notion to, to say, okay, so why are you fundraising? What do you want to achieve, right? You need to communicate with your team and your shareholders and stakeholders that, okay, now we are actually going into fundraising process. So you might go here and there, you know, shaking hands, getting to know the people around. Definitely makes sense to get to know them before, way before you start uh, fundraising. But this is not fundraising. Again, remember when Marius asked you, are you fundraising? If you didn't do all what we just mentioned, <laughs> you're not fundraising, right? So communicate once you're ready to your team that, you know, I'm going now uh, to fundraise, you know, my, my time spent on sales will be much lower, etc. Then curate the list of VCs, what just Marius mentioned, you know, that it's not that all VCs will match you or those that are the nearest to you will match you. So you really need to see uh, kind of the good fit and we also see when companies come to us when they really looking for something else, like three million. And uh, we as a pre-seed fund, we never invest three million. We don't have this capacity. So like we, we might talk with them because it's interesting, refer to other ecosystem players and kind of curated a pipeline to other investors. But we already see that they were just like bombarding, you know, cold calling and emailing everyone around. So that's already a little bit of a bad sign. And especially what Marius mentioned, looking through the portfolio and coming in and saying like, oh, I saw you have this and this company in your portfolio. I think your experience will be super relevant. That's really magic. Like you understand that they have done the homework and sometimes <laughs> understand your portfolio like much better than you might do yourself. Focus on lead investor. Again, don't go around uh, getting a lot of small tickets and soft commitments and something like, oh, some angel is interested. Get that one fund or that, you know, bigger angel that's ready to lead the round and then go with that flagship and say, like, I have the commitment. It's a game changer, like for sure. Believe me. And really don't start vice versa from small tickets and then someone to close and put, you know, the big 300 remaining ticket in your hands. You have to plan the future. Also what Mario showed, Syria, uh, seed, uh, series A, B, C, D, but focus now on this round. So don't kind of yeah, go and talk with, uh, you know, Axel fund or try to reach them if you're raising pre-seed. It's good to know them if you can get to know them, but it also will make much more sense to get to know them a bit later in the process. Be prepared, very technical things, but it uh, <laughs> makes a huge, huge difference. I think this is at least something we are really capable of just doing, we, we call this startup hygiene, you know, just putting the things together and bringing that kind of in front of the investor. Choose the best intros. Uh, you can do cold, cold emailing, uh, message on LinkedIn, apply on the website. But if you can get a referral through someone, that's the best. I think our, let's see, most investments in the past year happened through referrals from our alumni and other investors rather than from complete inbound. So that's also really make sure that you kind of look around, okay, so who might have interest to these and these particular funds because I know they're relevant to me. Here you go, this is my uh, blurb, you know, kind of forwardable email, can you please do this for me? That can really work well. Uh, as uh, said, schedule the meetings at once and then with few iterations. Okay, it's stage one of fundraising. We have, you know, uh, 60 VC funds, something that we didn't mention. Approaching free VC funds will not help you. Like, really make sure you understand, like, you'll have to approach a lot of them, right? So really go into, like, approach many, some will drop out, then go with those to the second stage, third stage. This will happen with the uh, iterations, right? Um, uh, use the back channels to get information. This is what I slightly mentioned. I if you know the people around in the ecosystem that might know the other investors, ask them like, you know, maybe you can check with the fund like what they are really thinking. Because also, like I cannot just put it on any other funds, also on ourselves probably. Sometimes uh, we have such a big pipeline, we really like, take time to follow up the company and then the company is waiting and like uh, waiting for the answer. Okay, so is it a yes or a no? So definitely uh, you can get that answer pretty quickly or ask <laughs> your current investor to kind of translate the email, which doesn't say yes, doesn't say no. What does it mean? Should I follow it up? Sh what should I do? Um, race to term sheet, something that you know might sound bad in, in, in essence because you shouldn't just race to any term sheet, but as mentioned, lead investor and something that strong commitment and actual commitment is needed for you to close around quickly. 
and something we didn't mention during the presentation, but something is super important, and you will uh, definitely hear from others as well, never mislead or never lie. So if you come and say like, oh, you know, this fund is actually the one to invest in us, the first thing I will do when, <laughs> when we will kind of finish the Zoom call, uh, I'll write to that fund and ask, are you really looking to invest in them? Like, are you doing a deal? So th this information goes quickly around the ecosystem much, much quicker no, than you might think. So these things, if you do that, I would say that you're in a much, much better position to fundraise, for sure, in, in a big, big mass of startups, even regardless of, you know, kind of how, uh, how big your MRR is. Of course, it matters at some point, but this is especially important in the early stage, so make sure you have it. So I think the question, again, is that we asked at the beginning, so are you fundraising? Can you answer now to yourself after seeing this? Are you fundraising? Are you doing it correctly? Yes or no, it's up to you. But this is it from us. And uh, we'll go into some questions. Yeah, probably let's stick together, right? Yeah. If we can read. Yeah, I can read. I uh, read your answer. Yeah, please. <laughs> okay, so we have a question. Da -da 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 -da. Okay, one question. Are, are we going to publish slides? <laughs> So the answer is uh, no. I think it's uh, uh, it's been recorded, so it's even better. You could have taken all the um, all the pictures, and you can I think review it again. So for sure, uh, for sure, take the use of that. Okay, Marius, how long does it take to approach the investor and get the result? How long all these process take? I've okay. mentioned slightly, but maybe it's worth uh, summarizing. Yeah. So. The fundraising is super time consuming. I mean, we don't try to scare you here and then uh, I've been myself in this position. And what we see that even from a super mature teams, by super mature, I believe that it's going to be the, the stars of Lithuania, the stars of the Baltics pretty soon in a couple of years. With the traction, with the team, with the solid 50% growth on a month over month basis, the guys were shocked and surprised that it took them four, six months to close the round. So typically we're saying that in early stage, it's, you need to be prepared that the fundraising can be up to six months from the venture fund. Of course, if you're going after the business angels, after accelerators, it can be one month, one and a half months with all the due diligence process, if you are prepared. It means that everything that we're speaking today, the data rooms, the plannings, the forecast, the materials are here. It's up to you how fast it can be. But if you go after the venture funds, after the syndicates, uh, syndicates joint rounds, et cetera, et cetera, it could be time consuming. And most important part, the fundraising is not the CEO job. The fundraising is the co-founder's co job. Of course, the CEO is leading, is showing the, uh, participating more in meetings, organizing. But when it comes to a decision, the co-founders is participating. And you need to keep in mind that by saying time consuming, it means that it's taking the time from the business, you as a co-founder, in the fundraising process, participating and being the part of this. And we have a lot of examples when it comes to a Series A uh, and the companies who want to go to US market, the dream market, right? And they're starting to raise the capital in the US. The founders basically living in the plane, living in the US for uh, four months. And by when we're trying to talk about the core team, the core team is someone who can handle your business when the founders are fundraising. That's why everyone should be on the same page in the company to, to handle this, uh, that uh, founders could focus on the fundraising. Cool. And we just got uh, one more question dropped in. Marius, do you have any books to recommend to read on this? Many books, probably, you know, we can share definitely after, after that to send the links to the organizers, of course. Yeah. Starting, you know, from the how to pitch, uh, to going to, to uh, how to prepare the materials, and then, of course, how to best approach to the investors. But all the key, probably, ideas, uh, of course, from the books that we're reading also you saw in the slides. But, of course, we'll share the list. Yeah, um, I would say one that you can note, it's uh, kind of the classic, it's called Venture Deals. It really explains from a founder's perspective how to approach the, the term sheet, how to approach the selection of investors. It's a kind of the 
good old book that I definitely would say all uh, entrepreneurs should read, quite technical, and one, no advertising, but we have our newsletter where we publish every month uh, recommendations on the books, and you can also look through like kind of historic newsletters and check it out there, and all those comes from other entrepreneurs, our mentors, investors, so much more than probably that we could name here. Uh, but yeah, then I think that's it for questions, and thank you, it's been really hot. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, guys. <laughs> One, two. Thank you, guys. Thank you for this masterclass. It uh, was a pleasure to have you here on the stage. Uh, for everybody who is over here or you're watching us online, we'll have a short break now for the 30 minutes, and we're going to be back here with a keynote, and also we're going to have a discussion here on this very stage. So we have a 30-minute break. Let's uh, see you around 11.30. Thank you so much.